So in the last episode, we learned about voltage and how from a source like a power supply or a battery is needed to make something like a motor run. Today, instead of this small motor with a lever on it, I just simply have a fan, which may be more analogous to this paddle wheel. But we talked about how with the voltage, with the switch on, how we have a, a current flow. And to, today's episode is going to be about current flow. I mentioned last week, real briefly, about how we're going to use current flow learning about it being from the positive to the negative. And I also mentioned that current flow is electron flow or electron movement. And to clarify that, it is known that electrons flow from negative to positive. And actually in, in one of the trade schools I went to, we actually learned it from negative to positive which was helpful in some things in learning the true nature of electron flow. So in learning how electrons flow, it's, it's just good to know that they do flow from negative to positive. However, when it comes to current flow, I have switched back to the conventional current flow method, which is just talking about, in general, a flow from plus to minus, or from the positive terminal or positive charge to a more negative charge. And the, and the reason being, I'll get into it more later, but for example, when it comes to electronics and symbols, such as a diode, a lot of these symbols were designed to work and be more understanding, especially to me, transistors, when we get into that into a later episode. I went back later and started trying to focus on it, flow being from a more positive to a negative. So as I mentioned before on these episodes, when I talk about current flow, I will be talking about from the positive to the negative, or what we call conventional current flow. So last week we talked about battery. Um, we talked about voltage last week. We talked about the pressure being similar to what we'd see on a gauge. I didn't actually have this gauge out last week, but I should have. I should have had it um, just to show that if the pressure, if the circuit has a pressure, then we can see it move on a gauge. And I, I show very similarly how we can take a meter, for example, the digital multimeter, and we can put it on volts. And we can just check the voltage and how much pressure, how much potential do we have across our battery and across our circuit. So we do understand that to make a circuit work, we have to have voltage. Now, once we have voltage and we have a complete circuit, then we have flow, just like this representing a battery. It's flow from positive to negative until the battery is depleted. But the talk about flow, well, what is flow? Well, electric current or flow is the flow of electric charge. What is the standard unit of measure for current? Well, it's the ampere. The conventional symbol for current, we call, we call current an amp for short, and the symbol is usually I. We'll get into that later more with Ohm's Law. But when we talk about an ampere or an amp, we're talking about a flow. And how do we measure it? Well, it can be easily measured with something like an amp meter. For example, for larger circuits, it's very nice to have an amp clamp. This meter will actually do more, more than one feature. It will do ohms continuity. It'll do amps AC. It'll do voltage AC and DC. 
It also has a non a non contact voltage alert on it as well. But this is actually made for AC, so household stuff. If we can uh, be in, in the breaker panel, or et cetera, we could actually clamp on and very easily tell the current of that circuit just by switching it to the, the actual position that we need. However, on a smaller scale, at least on the bench, it's typically easier for me. There's a lot more than one way to do it. We can actually just bring in a digital multimeter again. And this time we have a, a multimeter on common in milliamps. So we'll take this to milliamps. Milliamps AC. On this one we press the button to, on the yellow to go to DC. So we can do this more than one way. We can, we can break the circuit here and we can put the meter across here. This is the more positive side. So I'm going to put the, the red lead or the positive lead. This is the one going back to the negative post. I put the negative lead on. I'm going to actually move the meter here so you can see it a little bit better. So I have my leads on common and 400 milliamp range because I know this fans in the milliamp according to its data plate at 12 volts DC which we're putting nine across hope you can see that screen okay if we cut it on we'll see our milliamps go up around 80 is dropping off And of course, if I were to stop the rotor, the fan, it would be a little bit higher than with it running. So we can actually check how much current, even though we can't see the electrons moving, we can't see the current flow. We can see, we can see the work being done, which is not true in all electrical circuits. And we, but we can also see how much current are we pulling off the battery? Just like we can also in voltage, we can check and see how much voltage the battery has or if we're pulling down the voltage. So the same way as here, as the battery's depleting, we see it rotating and the current move. We can always check how much current's flowing with a meter, depending on the circuit. It can be a clamp type. They even do make clamp type that actually are lower, a lot lower range. I just don't particularly have one. I just I always like the accuracy of these for smaller, uh, smaller bench testing. But, uh, most digital multimeters will go up to 10 amps in line uh, current check. Okay, so I mentioned there was more than one way we could do that check. Just meaning that I didn't have to break the circuit here. If it was a way to test this without breaking the circuit, and this will help in troubleshooting as well, I could have went across my switch, which basically just jumps the switch out using the meter. So there's a contact point there that was open due to the switch being actually turned off. And by jumping it out, I have verified the circuit works. So I took that open circuit and I closed it with my meter because the current actually goes through the meter as it's being tested. It actually uses a shunt resistor to read off of, which we'll get into in later episodes. So what do we need to make current flow? What do we need to make this flow? Whether it's in our, our hydraulic analogy circuit, whether it's in the actual simulated electrical circuit, 
We needed voltage, as we discussed early in a previous episode. But one thing I wanted to mention is we also had to have a path. We had to have what's known as conductors. We'll talk about it being a wire at this point. As we simulated through this tubing, we can also talk about electrons flowing through wire. So a, a conductor is simply an object or a type of material that allows the flow of electric current, like metals, wires, terminals, uh, maybe it's traces on a small circuit board. But it, it allows for that path to be complete. Something like a switch can interrupt, and when you close it, it can also be a conductor through the contact point. So what's some things that don't allow current flow? Typically we call those insulators. And an insulator is just a material that does not allow the flow of electric current freely. And examples of that is glass, plastics. So this right here is a good example. So to some point air until it ionizes and even dry wood can be an insulator, but it's not a very good one due to humidity and dampness. So we learned that we had to have conductors, a force or a voltage applied, and a complete circuit path. And we learned how to measure current. We also learned that we, we measure current in amperes or amp and where voltage voltage had a symbol of V now we learn that amp has a symbol of I so now that we've learned current in the next episode we want to look at resistance I hope you enjoyed this episode if you liked it please give it a thumbs up please subscribe and thanks for watching